first section is this is your life. Let's just put it this way, you have had a very colorful life. This is a picture of David as Bar Mitzvah. Do you recognize this picture? Where it's were a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> if you remember, where were you born and raised? <laughs> <laughs> I can remember that. That's uh, New York City in the Bronx, particularly. Uh, around the concourse at 181st Street, for those of you who know New York. Um, and I was Bar Mitzvah right nearby. What is your, one of your fondest memories of your childhood? Uh, I lived on the same street as PS79 and spent most of my youth in the schoolyard of PS79. Um, it was a great neighborhood to grow up in. People were nice. Uh, they watched out for you. It was safe. Um, it felt like a small town, actually, when I hear people talk of small towns. It's a, it's a lovely place to grow up in. And what was your family like? What did your parents do? Uh, my father was a uh, clerk in a uh, what today would look like a Walgreens or a uh, CVS store. Um, he took a temporary job in the crash of 1929 and stayed on it for 35 years. So he held a job during the Depression, which was more than most people did. Uh, my mother stayed home raising my brother and uh, me until I was about uh, 10 or so. Then my mom went back to work. And, uh, uh, I worked as a secretary, a saleswoman, and uh, they spent their last uh, um, 15 or 20 years in New York, um, both working. And, uh, my brother and I had moved away at that time. Tell us about, if you can see the screen up here, tell us about this picture with your, your family and tell us about this picture with your dad. Okay, well, uh, let's see. The uh, first picture is my bar mitzvah. Uh, my mother and father and brother, and my brother is here. My parents have passed away, and they uh, were wonderful parents. And uh, um, so that just brings back lovely memories. I, uh, now the other picture, um, I was already balding, so uh, that's, uh, <laughs> and I don't remember where that was. But uh, my father was a great guy, and he loved to travel and do things, and we all went out and did things. I would imagine that's at a place like Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farm or in something like that. In front of like the that. Schlitz truck? In front of the Schlitz truck. So they had Schlitz at Disneyland. Um, okay, so it must have been a brewery. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. With my dad, it could have been a brewery. <laughs> well, he looks like he's having a great time, and he often did, so that's, that's a nice picture. And you had plans to become a merchant marine? Well, what, oh boy. You did, did, did your homework. I, I, I'm a researcher. I wanted to, yes, I know, I trained you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're damn good, too. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, at one time I wanted to join the Merchant Marine. I, I loved the water, the boats, uh, um, and I found uh, somebody who was going to hire me and I was going to sail off to Seville, uh, uh, and uh, it fell through and I was broken hearted. And, uh, and I never joined the Merchant Marine, but I, I, I would rather have done that than gone to college or anything else. This was, I was finishing high school and I wanted to go uh, out and see the world. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank we're glad you. you didn't become a Merchant Marine. Okay, so to get more scoop on David, I contacted four of his closest friends, handpicked by him, uh, two, two of whom are sitting in the front row here. But what David doesn't know is that I've contacted others, starting with his children, Beth, Ann, and Brett. I think you'll find it interesting to hear what they had to say about their dad. Me too. <laughs> so tell us about raising Beth Ann and Brett. Oh, they're wonderful kids. Uh, although Beth Ann, uh, Beth Ann was a charming child until she reached 14 and then woke up a miserable human being. And, um, and at 17, she woke up a charming woman again. And, uh, 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 she was great. And uh, Brett was very steady very quiet. Uh, he didn't talk much when he was a kid, and uh, uh, we always wondered if there was something wrong with him because he wouldn't talk. But he talks plenty now. He's made up for it. He's a professor. He talks all day for a living. Uh, but they were lovely kids, and uh, for a while I was a single parent raising them, and that was uh, uh, both trying and great fun. It's nice that uh, I didn't have to share them with anybody, but it's hard to hold a job, try to be active in a profession, and take care of teenagers. Uh, one of whom was acting out, <laughs> but it turned out well. They're lovely kids, and they're both successful, and they're doing well. What does it mean that you're all in the family business? 
Oh, that, I, that, my kids made me very proud. I always think it's an honor if your kid chooses to go into the family business. Uh, there are parents who push their kids into the business. But Beth Ann is uh, working for West Ed, uh, a place that once was called Far West Lab, where I work. They do educational research and development. And my son became a uh, professor. He's uh, an associate professor of French history at Morgan State University. So I have two educators. And um, I'm very proud of that because I think it's uh, about as honorable a profession as uh, one can be in. Great. OK, so here's what Beth Ann had to say about you. While you happily and proudly wear holy socks, bargain <laughs> ties. My and, three for a dollar, <laughs> three for ten dollars. Right, which you've already alluded to. And cheap glasses. You Twelve dollars a pair. That's what she said. <laughs> she said, can't you tell? I said, no. <laughs> You share your good fortune with everybody. You quack like Donald Duck. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's really good. That's how I entertain them when they're in the middle. <laughs> and double over with laughter at dirty or, or sophomoric jokes. Who is Paul Boomer, Boomer of fart fame? <laughs> oh, my. I had a famous record that my son and I would play every now and then and double up laughing all the time. It was when the famous uh, contest about who could make louder expulsions of gas. <laughs> and it was recorded. And Paul Boomer was the Australian challenger who came over on a cabbage boat to, to, to face his rival, Lord Windensmere. Now this is, uh, talk about sophomoric, you know. That this was the height of sophomoric records. Uh, and my son and I used to laugh at it all the time. We never stopped laughing at it. <laughs> that sure rolled off the tongue. I, I wasn't sure if you were going to remember that oh, one. I, oh, how yeah. can you forget Lord Windensmere and Paul Boomer? <laughs> <laughs> she says you are a tease. For years, Beth Ann thought the highway signs, watch out for falling rocks, were about an angry man throwing rocks from the top of the road. And soft shoulder meant she needed to reach over the car seat and give you a massage. <laughs> I told them some of the most outrageous stories, and until they were adults, they believed them. <laughs> you let Beth, Beth Ann ditch school. No wonder you had issues with 14 to 17. You let Beth Ann ditch school and tag along while you collected data and taught her about time on task and inter-rater reliability. It's all true. <laughs> I didn't have much else to teach her, and I earned a living. <laughs> you missed at sappy movies and sing at the top of your lungs at Passover Seders. You have a zest for life, but are outraged by social injustice. You know a lot about a lot, and when you don't know a lot, you chime in with confidence and certainty <laughs> anyways. <laughs> Everyone's convinced that's true. <laughs> Who knows? That's coming up, too. <laughs> You are an ideas guy, a big name in the small world of the academy who ardently and passionately works to improve teacher, teaching and learning. Brett had this to say about you. He agreed with Beth Ann. You have a zest for life whose hearty passions span food and wine, the performing arts, travel, hockey, your family, and junk mystery novels. You used to watch Johnny Carson's monologue with him and then sit down and eat a box of... Oreo cookies. <laughs> yes. At one time in my life, we would get those three rows of Oreos and a half gallon of milk, and he and I would finish the milk and the Oreos almost every night. Your bonding moments. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he says that his passions came from your passions, including your love of learning and teaching. You began, he also says, you began your career as a fairly narrow social scientist. Quite true. I was trained as a behaviorist and uh, had a pretty strong ideology about how to do research and uh, what uh, learning theory was and all of that. And um, uh, fortunately, um, I changed over the years, and I'm very pleased with the changes that have occurred. He's pleased as well. He said the only reason he kept you as a father, in terms of professionally, <laughs> is because you are one of the greatest champions of public education, the very institution that took you a scrappy kid from the Bronx to Stanford and beyond. You remind Brett of Nietzsche's aphorism, suggesting that maturity is when one regains the intensity of a child at play. You have that infectious maturity in your life, your work, your advocacy, and your love for your family. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I did good. Kids are great. Yeah, that's wonderful. Except Thank when they're toddlers. 
<laughs> or when they women when girls are 14. <laughs> sure. Okay, tell us about your relationship with Kenny Bergman. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, in um, seventh grade, we got to junior high, and the junior high, uh, the elementary schools in New York send from maybe three or four elementary schools to a junior high. And he came from a different elementary school, and we met in seventh grade. And within just a couple of weeks, we were, you know, bosom buddies and uh, stayed friends right into college until I ended up leaving the city and uh, moving west. And uh, we were almost inseparable. Um, we even owned a business together. And I'm sure if you talk to him, that was the, one of the highlights, uh, adventures of our lives. We, um, he was studying economics at Hunter, and I was in the business program at um, the Baruch School. And uh, we were both bored, and we decided we needed business experience, so we would buy a business. And so we bought a bar and grill. <laughs> we, we were 18. He turned 18 in April, I turned 18 in March, just before him, which was legal. You could drink in New York at 18 at that time. So we bought a bar and grill, and we drank the profits up. <laughs> no, we actually made money and uh, worked together for that summer and had the, the most fun summer you could ever have, two young guys owning a business. And, uh, um, and, and it, I might add that I changed my major from business to psychology because when you sit at a bar and listen to people, you realize how crazy people are in this world. And so I decided to become a psychologist. <laughs>